Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome to the second part of our Promoting the Best Standards of Practice series of the World Endoscopy Organization um, Best um, uh, uh, Standards of Practice uh, Committee. Um, uh, today, we are very lucky to have uh, a key two key guest stars who are uh, authorities in their field um, uh, in small bowel endoscopy. And together with my co-chair, um, uh, Professor Tibor Gökres from Hungary, um, uh, we welcome you to this exciting webinar. Today we will cover um, uh, balloon-assisted enteroscopy and we'll talk through the indications and the selection of patients to make sure that this uh, procedure is done safely and correctly. And then we'll hear the master himself, Professor Yamamoto, after um, uh, the introduction um, on selection of cases by Professor Penazio. Uh, we will hear from uh, Professor Yamamoto about the uh, technique itself. Uh, as part of uh, this webinar, we have uh, uh, discouraged um, the use of the chat function. And uh, if you wish to ask questions, we'd like you to... Uh, I use the Q&A um, uh, function for questions. I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions uh, and that will fuel the discussion of this exciting um, uh, broadcast. And uh, without further ado, I will pass the baton on to my co-chair, uh, Tibor, who will very kindly um, introduce our first speaker, um, uh, Professor Penazio. Thank you, Tibor. Thank you, Ed. Uh, our first speaker will be Marco Penazio, uh, working at the University Division of Gastroenterology, City of Health and Sciences, uh, Sciences University Hospital. Uh, he's a head of endoscopy, and this is located in Turin, in Torino, Italy. Marco, please. Hello. Thank you to everybody i'm very i'm very happy to participate in this exciting meeting uh, i'm talking about uh, the patient selection of uh, uh, for balloon assistant roscopy i hope you will be able to see my slides it's okay for you oh. yes you see the slides okay these are my disclosures. So, uh, started by uh, a definition, device assistant enteroscopy is the endoluminal examination of the small bowel by any endoscopic technique that includes assisted progression, i.e. by a balloon, an overtube, or other stiffening device. So, very briefly, device assistant enteroscopy can be divided into balloon enteroscopy, or into spiral enteroscopy. Spiral enteroscopy is uh, is based on uh, uh, so is based on uh, the rotation principle, either manual spiral enteroscopy or motorized spiral enteroscopy. Uh, I must say that the first technique has been abandoned, and also the second one is being abandoned, and withdraw and recall from the market for safety reason. Concerning balloon assisted enteroscopy, it, it is based on the, on the push and pull principle. We have balloon guided enteroscopy, which is that well, there is an inflatable balloon inserted through the, through the operative channel, which can advance and withdraw the instrument. But we have very paucity of evidence about this, uh, this device. Uh, we have balloon assisted enteroscopy. I'm not going into detail about this technique, which should be covered. Uh, extensively by Professor Yamamoto. We have double balloon enteroscopy and single balloon enteroscopy. Just a few words uh, sorry, about uh, the tech, uh, the, 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 the endoscope involved in these technologies. Uh, we have three kinds of enteroscope, uh, both diagnostic and therapeutic one with large operative channels, both by Olympus and Fuji, and especially the short therapeutic double balloon endoscope uh, the therapeutic single balloon with a, with a large accessory channel, which is short, and the shorter endoscope, which is very useful, we will see later on, for ERCP in patients with surgical alter anatomy. For those who are interested, these are the technical and clinical evidence publishing guidelines, first of all, by 
uh, more than 10 years ago by the American Society of Gastrointestinal Endoscopy, more recently by the Bajapan Gastrointestinal Endoscopic Society, and the technical review and the guideline, clinical guideline provided by the European Society of Gastrointestinal Endoscopy. Let's talk about patient selection uh, for bowel assistant telescopy. This is uh, quite uh, cumbersome and invasive technique. That's why we need to have a complete knowledge of clinical history of the patient, including previous abdominal surgery, previous abdominal radiotherapy, when the, in this situation the small bowel is more fragile, so we have to be very careful when we advance the instrument, and we'll see later on how to advance and to withdraw the instrument. And, we, and so we have also to have a complete knowledge about the medications, especially antiplatelets and anticoagulants, especially if you want to perform therapeutic procedures. Also, the findings of previous investigation is important, either a small bubble capsule endoscopy or cross-sectional imaging. For uh, uh, capsule endoscopy, we have some capsule endoscopy translating indicators that clearly allow us to choose the best First approach, either, either, either. It's presentation mode. So yes, either in uh, in uh, in uh, in favor of an integrated double balloon enteroscopy or in favor or a retrograde double balloon enteroscopy. So so it is important the, to choose the most appropriate setting and sedation according to the patient ASA class and procedural complexity and duration. It's important uh, that 90% um, of the examination can be done uh, under a deep sedation with proper fold, either for the anal approach and also the oral approach. For complex procedures, very lengthy procedures, maybe it is best to, uh, to use uh, general anesthesia with endotracheal intubation. Also, the decision to perform the examination should be made after careful consideration of the indication. We'll see in, in a few seconds which are the indications to these procedures. Also, the benefit of balance assistant enteroscopy must outweigh the burdens and the risk to the patient. And very important, a trained and experienced endoscopy team is essential to perform a safe and efficient procedure. Just to consider the indication of the procedure, we'll refer this uh, very recent paper in which the state of the art uh, of enteroscopy and be published in order to, uh, to, to perform the procedure in a safe and efficient way and to select uh, the best patient, the best candidate for the procedure. So the indication and the intervention using device assistant enteroscopy, mainly bilateral assistant enteroscopy, are first the hemostasis of for small bowel bleeding. We can do all kind of hemostasis in the, in the small bowel, the same hemostasis. Friedman argon plasma injections, sclerotherapy clips uh, uh, that can be done also in the upper and lower GI tract. I'm not going into details, but you can see here that we can treat all the, the hemorrhagic lesion in the small bowel uh, in a very safe and efficient way. Injection clips, argon plasma coagulation, uh, glue injection for 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 viruses. And you can see for this algorithm provider, the European Society of Gastrointestinal Endoscopy, the central role of the device system to ROSP in the management of these patients, especially in, in, in selected patients with overbleeding. It may be also considered a first line approach, but very important the specific management of patients with device enteroscopy on the basis of positive findings, a capsule endoscopy, and also in situation of recurrence of bleeding after a negative capsule enteroscopy as a clear and established role. Another important indication is the stenosis due to inflammatory bowel disease. I will see later on, it is important to, to consider this test, this technology in order to avoid or postpone surgery in these patients. Dilation of surgery is not so rare, especially in patients with Crohn's disease on in end cell related strictures. We have to choose the right patient by doing investigations with the dedicated small bowel cross-sectional imaging, choose the right patient to be treated, the evaluation of stretch, the number of stretch, the length of stretch, the sign of, of the, or after inflammation are important. The best patient to be treated are, are those who are short stretches, not very angulated, and not very, with the, not a large sign of inflammatory inflammation. So fibrotic and anastomotic stretches are you can see the slide advancing. 
It's very, it's very, it's very. Now we can see them advancing. Um, uh, maybe you could keep this mode and move down with the arrows. Okay, this, okay. this is great. Thank you. Sorry for interrupting okay. you, Marco, Sorry. but uh, we would like to see your beautiful slides. Thank you. Endoscopic balloon dilatation is, uh, is an efficient procedure that's being demonstrated by this meta-analysis that clearly showed that this is a very safe technology with a complication rate per patient about 3%. It has a high short-term technical and clinical efficacy in up to third of the patient may need radiation or surgery, but this is an alternative to so surgery. In the past, all these patients were sent to the surgeon for management of the stretch, and now it is a, 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 a great advantage to have a enteroscopy to delay this feature in this patient, which may alleviate their symptoms. Uh, another important, another important uh, role is the role of biopsy. You can see the high image quality improves the diagnostic capability of enteroscopy. And you can see here that uh, and also in the small bowel, the differential diagnosis is huge. And also in the small bowel does not automatically mean Crohn's disease. The differential diagnosis is huge, and you can see here the not only Crohn's disease, but T lymphoma, mouth lymphoma, vasculitis, ischemic lesions, tuberculosis, radiation injuries, and uh, and sage stricture. So that's why it's important when it is indicated to perform biopsy in, for, in order to uh, obtain a definite diagnosis. Also for polyposis syndromes, the enteroscopy is indicated. You, know, you can see we have different kinds of polypectomy of endoscopic mucosal resection from the classical polypectomy up to endoscopic mucosal resection. It is safe in Hesper and the small bowel. And also for, and we'll see later on the detail of this new technology, this new technique, ischemic polypectomy, either with the with the, put the clips on the stalk or uh, an endo loop. We, 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 it is be, will be shown later on how this technology, new technology works. Also in certain situations, you can do underwater polypectomy, but generally speaking, in patients with Perth-Sieger syndrome, which is quite rare, elective polypectomy should be performed for small bowel polyps, uh, about 15 to 20 millimeters uh, to prevent intussusception or bleeding. Also, in symptomatic patients, smaller polyps causing upsetting symptoms should be removed. Let's go on with tumors. It's important to perform enteroscopy in patients with suspicion of tumor because not only to perform biopsy, but sometimes you can discover tumor by performing enteroscopy itself uh, without uh, any preceding investigation, such as capsule or cross sectional imaging. But it's important that it is a test to confirm or to exclude the presence of tumor. And you can see also it is important to perform a tattoo in order to facilitate, to facilitate subsequent, more precise, and more limited uh, laparoscopic uh, surgery. Uh, you can see for this quite complex algorithm, the central role of enteroscopy, uh, balance system enteroscopy in the management of patients with uh, a suspicion of small bowel tumor, either after a small bowel capsule endoscopy or cross-sectional imaging or to confirm or to exclude the presence of a lesion. Also for palliative treatments with this new enteroscope with large operative channel, you can see that we, we put a stent in, uh, by using the telescope, uh, <clears throat> telescope technique uh, and this uh, in experience is a very limited indication, but it is a palliative treatment which can be useful sometimes to manage patients with the oncological problem. Also for the retrieval for foreign bodies, we are meta-analyzed about this, but you can see not only the capsule can be withdrawn and uh, retrieved by, by a DNA enteroscope, but also the tools and other foreign bodies like uh, plastic stents migrate in the small bowel. In the past, the only solution to remove this was uh, uh, surgery. Now we have this that can be very helpful to solve these uh, quite complex problems. Also for colonoscopy, you may you can imagine how how easy it is in difficult colonoscopy, previously fake colonoscopy, how easy it is, it, it is to perform a colonoscopy to reach the sequel with uh, uh, an enteroscope. And also in patients with malnutrition, gastric outlet obstruction, and ultra small bowel anatomy, uh, it is important sometimes to perform with, with where a, Percutaneous endoscopic gastroscopy. Gastrostomy is not uh, is not uh, 
feasible to to do direct assisted uh, um, enteroscopy assisted percutaneous endoscopy jejunoscopy in esper and so with uh, we can do also these uh, with an enteroscope and finally uh, more recently um, 80% of the literature cover all this uh, uh, this uh, topic. Uh, the access to the pancreatic or biliary tree to perform ERCP in patients with surgical alter GI anatomy. Uh, it is uh, quite complex. It is one alternative to other technologies, but with the balloon assist enteroscopy, you may reach uh, the, the, the biliary tree and to perform all kinds of uh, therapeutic maneuvers because of the large operative channel. And in this situation, you may use, you have to use the short enteroscopes because you have a, an adaptive bending segment, which may allow you to reach uh, and to navigate through a complex uh, and uh, loops uh, and to reach the papilla and to perform and to perform a ERCP. Uh, my last slide is uh, devoted to the rate of complication. You may see here that the major complication rate is, uh, uh, I mean, perforation, bleeding, pancreatitis is less than 1%. Uh, and also in uh, uh, therapeutic uh, enteroscopy, it's a little bit higher, so, but uh, this is a very uh, it's an updated in the slides. Uh, in the most recent paper, uh, shows that the complication rates for therapeutic enteroscopy is less than 1% again. Also, we have to, to, to have an attention to sedation relation complications. The rate is 0.5, and the, the most tricky procedure, I mean dilation of small bowel cross ratios and polypectomy of large small bowel pubis, the rate of complication is less than 3%. That's why the European Society of Gastrointestinal Endoscopy clearly state that uh, complication resulting for diagnostic uh, enteroscopy should be below 1% uh, and for therapeutic enteroscopy below 5%. Also, we have to be aware of the risk factor, risk factors for complication. I mean, resection for large polyps, active inflammatory bowel disease, sharp isolation of small bowel switches, uh, previous abdominal radiation therapy, the, 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 the small bowel and morphology in these situations, and ultra-surgical GI anatomy. This, this last slide clearly showed that you the, some take-home messages. Now today, after more than 20 years of use of, uh, of, uh, of balloon system enteroscopy, uh, we can state that this technology revolutionized the investigation and management of small bowel disorder because it has a high technical success high diagnostic and therapeutic yields and currently offers a safe and effective alternative to major surgery and offer represent the preferred option for treatment of small bowel disorders. Obviously, greater expertise is in dedicated centers. Difficult patients must be managed, must be managed by expert uh, endoscopy. And uh, I finish with this uh, few words about uh, to thank you for allowing me to participate in this exciting meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Penazio. Thank you, Marco. Um, uh, that was an excellent tour de force uh, and uh, a great introduction to this uh, great meeting here. Um, uh, you've highlighted why we should be careful on patient selection and uh, you've also uh, given us a very nice take-home slide that we we'll, we should keep in mind. Um, uh, to for those who don't know, um, uh, which is unlikely, uh, Professor Penazio has led on uh, the guidelines of the European Society of Gastrointestinal Endoscopy for uh, small bowel endoscopy, both the original guideline and also the updated 2022 um, uh, review of those guidelines. And he is also uh, an authority, especially for um, small bowel bleeding. He was the first to teach us that we should act quickly when we have small bowel bleeding because we might not find the culprit otherwise. So, uh, Marco, if I could ask you to stop sharing your slide so that uh, we can introduce our next speaker, um, uh, who's another world authority, in fact, the father of devices stentroscopy, Professor Hironori Yamamoto, was like a second father to me. He has invented <clears throat> double balloon enteroscopy, which came into clinical practice in 2001. So we're looking at over 22 years of uh, 
of its birth. Um, uh, Hero is also very well known for his invention of endoscopic submucosal dissection, having performed the first case of ESD with a modified uh, instrument. Um, uh, and he continues to innovate and uh, create these genius ideas for the betterment of patient care throughout the world. It is a huge honor and a privilege. Professor Yamamoto, Hero. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for your kind introduction and inviting me to this uh, talk in a, a WEO educational program. I'm very happy to talk about uh, double balloon endoscopy and I want to share my slides. Okay, um, can you see my slide now? Oh, not yet, maybe. Yes, we I can see your slides, Hiro, thank you. Okay, then uh, let's start uh, my talk. I will talk about uh, how to perform balloon-assisted endoscopy, so more focused on a technical issue. And this is my disclosure. And this is a double balloon endoscopy uh, using two balloons. One is attached to the tip of the endoscope and the other to the tip of the overtube. We can shorten the small intestine and, in and the endoscope can be uh, inserted further and further, and that can be used for either from the oral approach or and the uh, inner approach. So we can cover the uh, entire small intestine. And this is a single balloon endoscopy, and the balloon is only at the tip of the overtube and not at the tip of the endoscope. But the principle is the same. Uh, the idea of double balloon endoscopy came, uh, came up to my mind uh, by thinking about what is the problem? What are the problems in push endoscopy? Why a long endoscope cannot be inserted further in the small intestine? Just a long endoscope cannot solve the problem. And uh, my question was, is it absolutely necessary to straighten the endoscope? That's because when I uh, was trained in, a, in the United States 30 years ago, uh, I first visited uh, Dr. Shinya. He was the pioneer of and, and, uh, colonoscopy. Uh, one more method of colonoscopy was started by Dr. Shinya. And he told me that in order to reach the shikam, you have to control the endoscope to transmit the, the control applied to the shaft to be transmitted to the tip of the endoscope. In order to do that, you have to make the shaft straight. That was uh, his um, teaching to me. But uh, I thought, is that really necessary? Uh, it is impossible to make the entire small intestine straight. So I was thinking, is there anything which the uh, even with some carb and uh, something goes uh, in uh, smoothly. And I came up with this idea, a guide wire and a catheter. Even a catheter is carved and have even with looping, a guide wire inserted through the catheter can be controlled very precisely, goes in and rotate anything. Uh, what is the difference? What is the difference between the uh, endoscope in the small intestine and the guideway in the catheter? That is the uh, small intestine is stretchable, but the catheter is flexible, but not stretchable. So that is the difference I thought. So what I tried to do was the prevention of the stretching of the small intestine by using uh, Overtube with the balloon, uh, we can grip the small intestine to prevent the stretching of the carved intestine. Uh, in this way, uh, the, the uh, inserted endoscope can be advanced. Uh, the, if, you, if we insert five centimeters here, then the tip of the endoscope goes in five centimeters because this part is not stretchable. That was the idea. And then after the endoscope is inserted, then the overtube should be advanced and then uh, shorten the small intestine. Repeating this sequence, 
And the, the small intestine can be effectively shortened and the endoscope goes in deeper and deeper. So I applied a patent in Japan. It was, uh, it was 1998. And then I took to with the endoscopy company and, but uh, they, they didn't believe my idea. So I had to make the prototype uh, myself. So this is a hand type, handmade a prototype of double ball end endoscope. And using this uh, two meter endoscope with a 140 centimeter over tube, uh, I performed enteroscopy from the oral insertion and I could reach the cecum by the first attempt. That was December 3rd, 1999. And in this patient, I could find an ulceration at the opening of the Meckel diverticulum. So that was a successful uh, procedure. So I published uh, the uh, four cases to the gastrointestinal endoscopy that was published in 2001, total enteroscopy with a non-surgical sterile double balloon method. That was the first publication of double balloon endoscopy. And then, uh, <laughs> This is the first presentation in the BDW in the United States. The procedure was performed in the year 2000. The new method using the balloon that is attached to the tip of the endoscope and the sliding over tube with another balloon at its distal end. As long as stretching of the... This is an old video, so out of noise can be advanced by pushing it to the overture, even with some looping of the scope shaft. With this method, excessive stretching of the intestine prevented and possible straightening of the stomach and intestine not necessary. Hence, the procedure can be performed safely and with a minimum of patient discomfort. Endroscopy with double balloon method was performed. Because bowing of the instrument in the stomach is prevented by the overture fixed to the duodenum by the balloon, the tip of the endoscope is easily advanced into the third portion of the duodenum. A transparent hood is attached at the tip of the endoscope to keep a good view with minimum air inflation. Overinflation should be avoided for effective pleating of the intestine and to reduce patient discomfort during the procedure. As long as stretching of the intubated intestine is prevented, the endoscope tip can be advanced by pushing it through the overture. As you can see in this video, the endoscope tip can be advanced in the small bowel further and further without applying a forceful push. After repeating the sequence of the insertion procedure several times, the tip of the endoscope reached the region. Dirty mucus was accumulated in the dilated intestine. A stenotic region with inflamed mucosa was found at the distal side of the dilated intestine. Near the stenotic region, other holes were found on the intestinal wall that were thought to be enterocolonic fistulae. Using the double balloon method, observation of the mucosal surface of the affected area can be repeated going forward and backward because the insertion and withdrawal of the endoscope is controlled from the point fixed by the balloon. This can be done at any point in the intestine. Because an endoscope with an accessory channel and a tip deflection capability is used in this technique, Therapeutic intervention are possible as well. Biopsies were taken from the inflamed mucosa. 
The double barrel method of endoscopy will provide easier access to the final frontier of endoscopy. So this was the first um, presentation. And, uh, I want to talk about the tips and tricks for easy insertion. Uh, sometimes I was to told that uh, uh, insertion of double barrel endoscopy is not very, not very easy. Why is it not easy? That's because the gripping force by the balloon is limited to minimum. So small intestine can make complicated loops. And insufflated air can hamper effective shortening of the small intestine. So for easy insertion, we have to uh, advance the tip of the endoscope with minimum force and simplify the shape and avoid over insufflation like this. And I use uh, jiggling uh, of the tip of the endoscope very effectively. Uh, for example, if we make this kind of curve in the uh, intestine and if we just push, then that will make this kind of looping. But by just jiggling the tip of the endoscope, then it goes in, and by that goes in without pushing, it makes a straight shape. And even, even when we make a curve, with this angulation and just push, push up the, uh, the curved intestine, but jiggling the tip of the endoscope and uh, make the tip angle uh, straight, then we can make a natural curve with the shaft. So that kind of um, technique is very useful. And push with minimum air, uh, min min minimum, minimum force. If you push too much, then just overtube balloon slips and the overtube goes back. It's like a, a car driving on desert. The excessive power causes we just wheel spin. So gentle, gentle uh, control is very important. And mi minimum air insufflation is also important. Uh, if you insufflate air, then you will stretch the small intestine and even the same length is inserted, it's not effective. And in addition, the shortening is not also effective. Obstacle for shortening, the gas uh, makes the, uh, the shortening difficult. So the, we use carbon dioxide gas insufflation, but uh, even the CO2 is still um, the obstacle. So no gas is the best. We use water, minimum water exchange method. That is like this. Only a small amount of water is infused through the, uh, the, the water nozzle uh, that is for the lens washing. So the, just a little bit of water can keep the endoscopic view. And by keeping the endoscopic view with just a small amount of water and just swinging the tip of the endoscope, then you can advance the endoscope tip. And um, Balloon-assisted endoscopy is very useful for therapeutic endoscopy. I want to uh, introduce the, how to do the uh, therapeutic endoscopy. Uh, for example, hemostasis and the polyp strangulation and balloon dilation. Uh, we can see various types of small bile vascular lesions like these. And we proposed the uh, endoscopic classification of the vascular lesions, uh, we divided um, to type one, two, three, four, and type one is a uh, uh, capillary le lesion. So uh, erythema with, with or without oozing, oozing type of bleeding. And type two is an arterial lesion. It has a pulsatile bleeding. And this type 2A is just a, a minor lesion with the pulsatile bleeding. This is the most difficult lesion to find. I will show you an example. This is the type 2A lesion. Without bleeding, it's almost impossible to find. But this time, uh, I could find it because there is a clot on the 
mucosa. So I thought this is the bleeding point. This is the bleeding point. So there I tried to apply a clip and just by uh, stimulation by the clip, it started bleeding. So it's a uh, arterial bleeding. So the, uh, as long as we can find it uh, uh, endoscopically, then uh, endoscopic clipping can be applied uh, easily. And when we uh, try to find the uh, bleeding point in a patient with uh, ongoing bleeding, I recommend to perform uh, balloon-assisted enteroscopy from the oral insertion without preparation. That's because the blood goes down to the anal side. So the, until we reach the bleeding point, we, can, we don't see a lot of blood. And when we see blood, that is, uh, that is close to the bleeding point. In this case, uh, the blood is here. So then uh, I looked for the bleeding point and I could find the bleeding point here. So uh, the, uh, by using the oral insertion, the blood in the uh, intestinal lumen can guide you to find the bleeding point. Then uh, if you can find the bleeding point, then endoscopic hemostasis is uh, feasible like this, okay? So the small intestinal bleeding goes down to the anal side from the bleeding point. But if you do the retrograde insertion, you will uh, push up the blood. And in addition to that, uh, the dark blood makes the insertion very difficult. And even with the preparation, uh, regurgitation of blood makes the identification of the bleeding point very challenging. So if you perform anti-grade oral insertion with the preparation, then the blood is washed away, so easily miss the bleeding source. And then we recommend anti-grade insertion without preparation. Then when we find the blood, that is close to the bleeding point. And the next is the polypectomy, uh, polyp. Uh, this is the Poitzegas syndrome non-surgical management of small bowel polyps in Hodgkin's syndrome. Uh, we, show, we published our experience uh, that uh, by repeating double balloon endoscopy <coughs> with polypectomy, <coughs> we can reduce the number and the size of the polyps. <coughs> Recently, we don't perform polypectomy, we just use strangulation. And closed clip method is very effective. I will show you how to do it. This is the stalk of a polyp. And first clip is applied to the neck of the polyp. And I use a um, four millimeter transparent cap. By using the tip of the cap, rotate the first clip. And the next clip is applied to make a 90 degree cross. Then the strangulation is completed. So this is the example, just one clip, the polyp is still red, but with crossed clip, then the, uh, the ischemic change occurred. So this is the video, here is the polyp. Hoytzegas polyp is a hamartomatous polyp, and with a good uh, small neck, then this is a very, very low uh, risk of malignant polyp. So just apply a clip and rotate the clip and uh, place the next clip with 90 degrees crossing. Then ischemic uh, change occurs. And the, then without cutting the polyp, it will fall out eventually. And the next one is a balloon dilation. Uh, we use this cast hood, calibrated small caliber tip transparent hood. Uh, and that, this, this cap has the measure here. And this is good because the sometimes the, the uh, insertion of a guide wire through the, in, the structure could be very challenging like this. 
uh, this is the Crohn's disease and inflammatory polyps before the stricture. So it's almost impossible to find the stricture, orifice of the stricture. But using this cap, we can insert a guide wire through the stricture easily and dilate the stricture with the balloon dilator. And then the endoscope can be inserted through the stricture like this okay so uh we published the the usefulness of this cast hood to endoscopy and this is the, uh, the example how to how we measure the uh, the, the size of the uh, stricture and dilate it the inner diameter of the tip of the cap is four millimeter and out, outer diameter is six millimeter and the first uh, this line is seven, eight, and nine. So the we can measure we can measure the uh, the stricture, and then uh, we could dilate ten strictures in one session in this patient, like this. And selective contrast study is also available easily with double balloon endoscope. Without the endoscope balloon, the uh, contrast goes back to the the, the way to, uh, along the shaft. But uh, using the endoscope balloon, we can make a good contrast study. I can show you the difference. With that balloon, the infused uh, contrast goes back along the shaft of the endoscope. But with the balloon at the tip of the endoscope, it's inflated to block the backflow of the contrast. Then we can have a good contrast study of the small intestine. And the last one is a short double balloon endoscope, uh, EI580BT. Uh, as uh, you have already heard from uh, Marco, a uh, short double balloon endoscope is very useful for uh, ERCP in patients with altered anatomy. And using the standard endoscope, it is very challenging to access the biliary tract, but using the double balloon endoscope, we can reach the uh, biliary tract. So then we can perform ERCP. This patient is... Uh, 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 had a stricture at the anastomosis at the uh, after the living donor liver transplantation, and we performed double balloon endoscopy with the short double balloon endoscope and dilated the stricture, and so the jaundice uh, solved. And this is also, short double balloon endoscope is also useful as a coloscope for difficult colon. And uh, this is an example. Uh, this patient had an adhesion between the transverse colon and ascending colon. So it was impossible to straighten the transverse colon because here it's adhesion between the transverse colon and ascending colon. So the, <coughs> even with this kind of sharp angulation at the hepatic flexure. <coughs> balloon overtube can prevent the stretching of the transverse colon and we could reach the cecum. So total colonoscopy was possible uh, using with uh, double balloon endoscope in a very challenging patient. And it also gave us a uh, stable con control in uh, <coughs> unstable colon. It is useful in uh, ERCP, yeah, no, no, ESD in the, in the colon. This patient had a, a flat lesion in the ascending colon, and uh, we performed the ESD using a short double volume endoscope. And I want to go quickly. And uh, as you can see, the overtube is just placed on the table. And then uh, the endoscope control is very stable. So we could perform ESD successfully without 
making any complications like this. <laughs> so conclusions. Gentle maneuver is essential for balloons assisted endroscopy. To make the next insertion easier, the shape of the inserted endroscope should be arranged to be simple. If you have a complicated looping, then the, uh, the insertion uh, becomes very difficult. Um, rather than struggling with the complicated shape, it's better to arrange the shape. And it is rather easy to arrange the shape because the balloon can grip the uh, intestine to prevent the withdrawal of the endoscope tip. So they just uh, gentle pulling with uh, jiggling and you can arrange the shape and simplify it. And balloon assisted endoscopy realized the endoscopic treatment even in the deep portion of the small intestine. And BAE is also useful for ERCP in altered anatomy and difficult colon. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor Yamamoto. Thank you, Hiro. This was such a beautiful, uh, you know, overview of your genius. Um, and uh, thank you for developing this safe and effective device that has stood the test of time. I can't believe that it's already 24 years since uh, <laughs> you made that made that presentation unbelievable and and truly it it is still helping patients throughout the world and this is the message here and um, we see technologies come and go but yours is designed with safety um uh, not to harm the small bowel but also to be effective and the principles behind it using the seldinger technique uh, with the overtube preventing um, uh, any stretching of the bowel is is incredible. It's it's really genius. So we are so privileged to have you with us. And thank you also for making the effort despite your cold. Um, uh, thank you. Um, uh, Tibor, I don't think there's any questions active at the moment, correct? No, any question, but I have. If I yes. have. Yes, okay, please, okay. please, fire away, my dear uh, friend. And this question goes to the both uh, lecturers because they are working in a different part of the world. Uh, we did not mention the, the sedation issues of this procedure because it's a long lasting procedure and the patient comfort is very important. Uh, okay, general anesthesia or monitored anesthesia care or conscious sedation, what is your practice? Marco and Ivo. My practice, <clears throat> uh... So generally speaking, uh, sedation protocols are also based on local organization situation. And generally speaking, I think the, the deep sedation monitoring and uh, carry sedation is uh, sufficient in 90% of the, ca the cases. But for difficult, tricky procedures, long procedures, uh, I mean, polypectomies, uh, several polypectomies. So uh, I think the general intubation, uh, general anesthesia with the oral tracheal intubation is, uh, especially for the oral approach, especially for the oral approach, is um, mandatory in my in my in my opinion. For the anal approach, there is no need to to do this, but except uh, certain. Uh, situation which shall be discussed on case by case. Also, we have to you have to discuss. Uh, Every time with your anesthesiologist, uh, uh, what is the best uh, uh, solution for that patient? Ivo? Okay. Uh, in my case, the uh, for the the anal insertion, anal insertion is safer and more uh, comfortable for patients. So we just perform anal insertion of double bar endoscopy with conscious sedation. But for oral insertion, uh, deep sedation, and uh, uh, almost patient uh, uh, sleeping situation, but without intubation. Uh, but uh, patients of the pediatric population, uh, we, we do general anesthesia with intubation and uh, respiratory or cardi uh, cardiovascular unstable patients, we ask uh, the general anesthesia as well. Uh, okay. Tibor, may I, may I uh, comment as well um, uh, on this uh, very, very important question? In fact, it was one of my questions too. So thank you for bringing it up, Tibor, really. Um, um, yes, it's, it's, always, it's always a big issue. 
Um, and the way we tackle it in my center, uh, where we do up to nine double balloons uh, in a week, um, is that we set up a multidisciplinary team meeting for small bowel endoscopy and other complex procedures such as ESDs and resection. And we discuss uh, the cases on, on their own merits, um, uh, taking in mind age of patient, comorbidities, other risk factors. We discuss, as, as Marco very rightly mentioned, the indication to be absolutely correct, because even if we can do a double balloon, we might not... Um, uh, uh, it might not be the best way forward for the patient because the risks outweigh the benefits. But we we uh, stratify these patients accordingly. Um, uh, and and uh, Hero, um, I think you also mentioned um, uh, in your talk that while doing the oral approach, especially if there is not um, endotracheal intubation, it is critical to empty the uh, upper GI tract from any fluid to reduce the risk of aspiration. Yes. That's very important. Uh, so before you go through the pylorus ring, you have to aspirate all the uh, the uh, fluid in the stomach. And then after the uh, double balloon endoscope is inserted to the small intestine, the overview balloon uh, block the regurgitation of the fluid uh, to the to the stomach side. So the, the regurgitation goes through the overtube. So just to uh, go through the overtube, doesn't go into the lung. So as long as you make the uh, stomach completely empty before going into the small intestine, then uh, it, it makes the procedure much safer. Thank you for Thank mentioning. You. Thank you. Um, Tibor, I think there's a question. Yeah, there is a question. Uh, it's easy for the experts. Is the DB of universal length and width for every application? Who wants to answer it? Length is two meter for the small intestine and the short one and 150 centimeters. And uh, I think, Hiro, um, uh, you brought back the... Uh... Uh, first type of scope that was developed, the, the version, the newer version of the P5, correct? You have uh, a slimmer version now and the standard version, and they have different working diameters and different channels. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. The current, the currently available uh, therapeutic one, uh, the outer diameter of the endoscope is 9.4 millimeters, and 3.2 millimeter accessory channel. And the uh, diagnostic one is only 7.5 millimeter uh, the outer diameter, but the accessory channel is limited to 2.2 millimeters. That is uh, currently available. Thank you. Thank you. Thank yes. you. Marco, I've got a, a question for you. Um, uh, uh, touching upon um, preparation and management, because you are the lord of bleeding, of small bowel bleeding, with all your uh, great publications and the uh, knowledge that you've given us. And as you know, even though we have double balloon entroscopy, which has been around for 24 years now, um, uh, sometimes we have patients who are refractory, especially the ones who have small bowel intestinal vascular lesions, as Hiro showed us with the Hironori, uh, with the Yamamoto Yano classification, and also what we call angioectasias, um, repeated bleeding episodes, um, repeated uh, procedures, their age gets higher as they get older and they get more comorbidities. Where do you see adjunctive medical therapy coming in in your own clinical practice, not just the literature, um, uh, when combined with device-assisted endoscopy, please? Yes, okay. Uh... First of all, before starting uh, medical therapy, you can also repeat enteroscopy <laughs> and uh, in order to, to try to solve uh, the bleeding uh, problems. Okay, today we have evidence uh, uh, that uh, two drugs are effective in reducing the bleeding episode. We have uh, octotide, octotide long-acting octotide, which can be useful uh, sometimes in patients with the big comorbidities, can, cannot be 
performed several types of enteroscopy, and we have the recent evidence uh, that uh, also from the OCEAN trial, which has been published in Gastroenterology in, in December 2023, which for the first time in the randomized version clearly showed that the use of long-acting octreotide is uh, useful in reducing bleeding episode, especially in patients with multiple diffuse vascular angiotasia. And also we have the evidence in a trial, I don't know how it is a widespread in clinical practice of the use of thalidomide. Thalidomide is a very difficult drug, I must say. I have a very limited special uh, experience with the use of thalidomide. It has been demonstrated in a randomized trial that clearly showed, published in the New England Journal a couple of months ago. However, you have to be very careful with this drug because, because uh, I ask my colleague, hematologist colleagues who uh, use this drug uh, more frequently to help me in, the, in, the, in, the, in managing also side effects because uh, we can use uh, low dosages uh, for uh, treating uh, difficult, pa difficult patients with the refractory bleeding because sometimes no matter the, the number of enteroscopy you perform, uh, uh, bubble assist enteroscopy you perform in these patients, uh, some and uh, sub iron supplementation, this patient need uh, some medical therapy. And now we have the evidence uh, demonstrated in, in the randomized control trial that this can be two useful uh, adjunctive uh, drugs which can be used in selected patients. Thank you. Tibor, I think there's another question. Another two from uh, one person. Uh, one is about, the first is about uh, what are the expert rate of complete enteroscopy with a single session uh, W bar enteroscopy, example, oral to circum from per aura root? Okay, this is an interesting question, but some the, in the majority of cases, not this is not the goal to reach the circum. But if you want, in how many percentage do you reach? Marco? Okay, Marco, please. I can say that total enteroscopy is not always necessary, but if you if you need to perform total enteroscopy today, the best technique is uh, I must say today is double balloon because in expert ends you may have reached total enteroscopy in 80, 85 percent of the cases with a single approach. Uh, uh, I is uh, very limited, uh, three to five percent. But sometimes you have the possibility to perform a double approach. To 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 to. Sometimes there is no need uh, to perform total enteroscopy because uh, the lesion is located in the upper on the lower part of the small bowel. The best technology available today to perform total enteroscopy, and there is also demonstrated by a randomized control trial, is is double bowel enteroscopy. Uh, motorized parenteroscopy was very successful, but uh, we can discuss it later on. It was uh, withdrawal from uh, from safety reasons. Okay, Hero. Yes, I totally agree with Marco. Uh, uh, if we try, but still, uh, it will be about five percent. I I would say, uh, but it's not necessary, and do, and it, we shouldn't do that because the. No. The combination of uh, transanal and transoral is much much safer and better because the uh, the from the anal approach it's really difficult to reach the stomach. So the if you go from the oral route, it's possible, but uh, it it causes uh, higher risk of pancreatitis. So we don't do a lengthy procedure from the oral. Route. So we want to yes. limit the uh, uh, length of the procedure time. So the, I don't I don't do that. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yes. And with your permission, Tipo. Yes, thank you. So I have a comment on that. Um, uh, I must say, and this is my mantra, and I always say it in my talks: the role of complete enteroscopy, pan enteroscopy, is almost zero. Okay, in true clinical practice, we don't need it. Um, uh, if you are uh, seeking to do a a complete visualization of the small bowel, which ha we have much less invasive tools um, uh, like capsule endoscopy, like a CT entrography, if you're concerned about a tumor. So this was the fad that drove um, uh, the initial enthusiasm for motorized spiral entroscopy, for example, which caused great harm. Oh, it's got great pan entroscopy rates. 
we don't need panenteroscopy in clinical practice. It's crazy. We don't need it. Um, and there's something wrong if you, if you are seeking panenteroscopy all the time. The target here is to hit the target, to go and find a lesion. Now, sometimes um, a capsule misleads us. A CT program misleads you. What do I mean by that? I mean that uh, you are uh, guided by the capsule or the CT enterography that says you should approach this lesion from the top end, from the oral route. And sadly, uh, it has a, 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 a miscalculation and the lesion is much more distal. That is when you probably need to approach the lesion again through the opposite route. But in clinical practice, pan enteroscopy is not needed, really. That is that is the main message, I think, here. And I, I think you experts will agree with me. Yes, definitely. Definitely. Yes. Okay, let's move on with the questions. One question has disappeared, but I remember uh, uh, this guy asked for tips in uh, uh, technical tips uh, for patients in uh, after UNY gastric bypass. I just what mentioned that not only hepatobiliary intervention can be an indication, but even to get into the gastric remnant, if there is a suspicious of uh, gastric uh, uh, pathology, then that can be another indication. Uh, okay, but I, I think the question is about mainly about the pancreatobiliary uh, balloon. Uh, what special tricks do we have, uh, Hero? Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, the I, I mentioned about uh, uh, no gas method with just uh, minimum water. But uh, if we just go with minimum water water exchange, uh, we easily miss the anastomosis. So the and uh, near the anastomosis, we have to insufflate the with the gas and see the um, which way is the uh, the uh, affluent limb. So the uh, we, first we have to find the, the anastomotic point, and then uh, uh, which is the the the, the affluent limb and the effluent limb. And in order to uh, find out which is the affluent and effluent, uh, we use a, a little bit of indiocarmine as uh, infused at the duodenum. And uh, in the coming goes to the efferent side, efferent limb side. So the, then the, the blue color is uh, there that we assume that the efferent limb and uh, the blue color disappears. That is the way to go, the uh, efferent limb. So that is one tip. Thank you. Very useful. Uh, another is uh, uh, to study small bowel lesions, which methods is more accurate, capsule endoscopy or double bowel enteroscopy? Of course, these are complementary methods. Okay, who wants to answer? Can I? Okay. If the, if the lesion is a, a, a tumor like lesion, and uh, that is uh, already detected by CT, then I think double bowel endoscope is a uh, is bit, uh, more accurate. But uh, if that is a, a tiny uh, vascular lesions, maybe a capsular endoscope uh, can detect better because it's physiological examination. Okay, Mark, we are a lot of questions. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, would you like to close or may I have another question? Uh, no, let's have another question. Um, uh, and uh, I have a couple of questions. We always go slightly over the top of the hour because we'd like to capitalize on the educational value of these broadcasts. Um, uh, we aren't governed really by time, but mostly by the educational uh, drive here. So please. Okay. I just want about asking about the training, how to learn uh, 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 enteroscopy, balloon enteroscopy, and what about uh, about the competence, the maintenance of reach the competence and maintain the competence? If I may, uh, mm -hmm. uh, word. so I think that uh, uh, if you want to learn uh, enteroscopy, uh, okay, you have to 
go in a center who has all the technology available to perform not only enteroscopy but also small bowel capsule endoscopy. We have a, it is a, must be a dedicated center for small bowel endoscopy. So the the oral approach is easier. The anal approach is a little bit uh, troublesome. So that's why uh, it's not only to learn enteroscopy but also for expert to maintain to maintain to do uh, to do not. Uh, nine examination per week as in the, at the Royal Free, but uh, to do everyday enteroscopy in order to maintain uh, the competence. Also, going to big centers will perform several procedures and, 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 so, and especially to be an, a, an expert endoscopist at the start and, and to become also proficient in enteroscopy by, uh, by performing several procedures uh, and to follow several procedures, especially for the ARN approach that uh, we have seen the, the presentation by Professor Yamamoto, how the anal approach can be sometimes quite uh, quite tricky, tricky, complicated. Yes. Um, I have I have a couple of questions for Hiro. Thank you, Marco, for that uh, intervention. So, Hiro, you mentioned jiggling and you also mentioned um, uh, the anti-clockwise looping. Um, uh, I wish you to briefly, for those who are listening, maybe in uh, other parts of the world where they are using uh, uh, older enteroscopes um, and have limited resources, especially when it comes to general anesthetic, and they need to pay, keep the patient safe and comfortable. So the uh, tips and tricks that you give them are critical to achieving success here. So what do you really mean by jiggling and how do you encourage anti-clockwise looping? If you could even demonstrate with your hands, <laughs> um, uh, okay. maybe we can uh, zoom in. Okay, when the tip of the endoscope has some curve, just pushing doesn't work because the it will... The, you want to go to this way, but the pushing just go this way. So you you will um, you will just stretch the small intestinal loop. But uh, by swinging the tip of the uh, I jiggle like uh, right and left or up and down and in and out. By doing that, the friction between the tip of the endoscope and the small intestine is reduced, so it slips in. By slipping, slipping in, then the angle becomes dull. Then the uh, the advancing force can be transmitted to the tip, and then make a natural curve and goes in. And how how do you how do you move it? Is it by moving the wheels up and down and twisting the shaft like this? Twisting the shaft or up and down or in and out three ways. Combination gently, of gently doing this. Okay. Yes. Okay. And uh, patient <clears throat> position um, uh, to to achieve maximal insertion depth. I remember that you um, uh, had studied uh, what the loops are like fluoroscopically um, to translate them to when you do not have fluoroscopy. Uh, number one, we know that we don't need to use fluoroscopy, but you looked at the fluid level, correct? Um, yeah. And if the patient is in the supine position, the fluid mm -hmm. level should be on the left to encourage mm -hmm. those anti-clockwise loops. Tell us yeah. about it. Yes, because the, uh, for example, uh, if we go from the anal route, then the curve is along the colon, and in and we make the curve with up angle, so the uh, that means. The right side is abdominal side, and left side is the uh, posterior side. So the if the patient is on supine position, posterior side is the dependent side of the gravity. So the fluid is on that side. That means the left side of the, the view. As long as you keep that direction, you, you are keeping the same curve just making the concentric circle. That is, uh, that is the, uh, the ideal shape you make for the uh, and, deep and the clockwise. And the clockwise. Yeah. And this boils yeah. down to nature and the Fibonacci um, uh, spiral we find in nature all the time. If you open up a Nautilus or if you look at uh, 
vegetation where there are spirals, they're always anticlockwise and they always come out with a shape like that. And it comes down to embryology as well. It's an anticlockwise loop that a small bowel develops. Now, I always see you um, ending up with the enteroscope like this on your left-hand side in a horizontal fashion. Is that to encourage the anticlockwise loop? Yes, that's right. Because the always the, the direction of the the uh, bottom of the the uh, suction or uh, in circulation bottom is on the uh, the twelve o'clock of the endoscope, and uh, that is the up upside of the angle. So the uh, if the patient is supine and making like this, then that is the natural curve of the anti-clockwise uh, looping with the direction of the upper angle. Very natural way. Amazing. You understand, you understand my explanation? Of course, yeah. very clearly. <laughs> if Look, I may add um, one, one, one word. Yes, please, Marco, Marco, no, please. Also, by following the rule, the Yamamoto rules, I must say, it's also not, not forget that sometimes also abdominal joint compression may help yes. uh, progression in difficult situations. So following the rules and also add some abdominal with the, the yes. nurse or a system that can help you also in difficult situation. Yes. I agree, especially, yes. Especially in the context of adhesions, you know, um, because the bowel, although we talk about the uh, anticlockwise spiral looping, when, when we have adhesions, sadly, the bowel is um, not able to take natural shapes. It's, it's caught up. And uh, number one, exercise great caution in the context of adhesions, yeah. because that is when harm can happen and have a low threshold to bail out. And number two, um, as Marco very kindly pointed out and usefully, uh, we, we have to consider massage or um, gentle abdominal pressure to constrain those difficult loops. Um, Tibor, as much as we'd like to continue chatting um, uh, until, you know, uh, many hours, and there's a lot to talk about here, we have to wrap. Um, uh, I'd like to summarize um, uh, Professor Pennazio Marco's beautiful presentation about safe selection. You can access this, um, this, this whole best practice series is mainly aimed to keep a, uh, a library, okay, for uh, posterity. And you can access these. So always select your patients carefully. Um, it is uh, encouraged to have multidisciplinary team meetings. As you heard Professor Pennazio tell you, um, uh, really carefully select those patients and make sure that you're doing the procedures for the right indications um, uh, so that they, they will get the best possible care. As you've also heard Professor Yamamoto Hiro tell you, um, there are tips and tricks, um, never really push, um, uh, be gentle, don't insufflate, jigging, uh, gentle movement to encourage the bowel to come onto the scope rather than to push it away from you, encourage anti-clockwise looping, um, uh, and, and be gentle. Uh, this is a, a technique that has been designed with safety in mind. I wish to thank both speakers for their tremendous contribution, and I'm sure they will be open for questions should you wish to pass them on to us here at the WEO Standards of Practice Committee. I wish to thank my co-chair and dear friend Thibaut Gokrish from Hungary for uh, uh, fantastically chairing this beautiful broadcast with me. And I thank you all for attending. Um, uh, I wish to uh, uh, invite you to the next um, uh, parts of this uh, series. So we'll focus on different types of uh, upper GI endoscopy, both on the diagnostic and therapeutic fronts and on lower GI endoscopy on the diagnostic and therapeutic fronts. And this ties in with the mission of the WEO to be um, uh, the voice for uh, uh, endoscopy throughout the world, wherever you practice. Uh, and to this end, I invite you to Endo 2024, which is the uh, World Congress, the Ford World Congress on GI Endoscopy, which is going to be held in beautiful sale in July um, from the 4th to the 6th. Um, uh, and I encourage you to continue to follow the WEO um, uh, to help us um, uh, provide this uh, message to the whole world. Um, without our sponsors, this would be impossible to achieve. So I thank our sponsors and I encourage you to continue supporting this global mission 
for the betterment of care in endoscopy wherever clinicians are trying to provide it um, uh, because we need to strive to get um, uh, uh, the best of care everywhere in the world. Thank you so much.